that way. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Three new, completely 100% identified with Christ. That's an awesome thing. Bring it up, Rich. We have um, baptismal certificates for you. And then we have, we are giving you a new Bible, each one of you. Eileen, there's yours. We trust that you will read these. Mr. Gabe, take that one right there on top. And here's your certificate. Make sure your mom and dad get that. Elijah, you did it, girl. And there's... <laughs> And there's your Bible. I hope you like pink. All right. Let's give them a big hand clap and give the Lord a clap. Amen. Awesome thing. Woo. Thank you all. Kiddos, you guys head to your classrooms. Youth, head on upstairs. Praise the Lord. If you don't mind. I think of all things to do as a pastor, baptizing people is like one of the, the most fun. I can tell you the most stressful thing is marrying people. <laughs> Listen, that show, uh, what is it, Godzilla Brides or something? <laughs> Bridezilla? They ain't lying. It's the truth. And bride's moms, they're tough. Grooms, they're pretty laid back. It's whatever, dude, I just want to get through this, okay? So it, it's, a, it's an interesting time, interesting dynamic, but as a pastor, baptizing people is by far the most fun because you know what they're getting into and you know if they got into it they got the goods to survive it because Christianity can't I mean it can be really difficult if you don't get into the word and know what the word says it can be very difficult because here you have something you believe in your heart your head knows what it ought to believe because your heart's telling it but you're not carrying it out. And so you're living contrary to the very spirit that's inside of you. That's a hard way to live. Because you do things that are wrong and you feel guilty about it. Con condemnation gets on you and all kinds of things. And trust me, believers don't help you out either. They will tell you when you're flat on your face, you know. Hey, look at you. You're on your face. You like it down there? I've had people tell me all kinds of things in my Christian life is um, before I got into being a pastor and, and preaching the word, people would say all kinds of things to me. You know, like uh, we were out someplace and it was Friday and we went to this, my boss said, hey, let's go up to this place, a little dive up on the hill in Clifton. But man, they had some great juicy, greasy hamburgers. Well, it was Lent, and the two guys that I went with were both Roman Catholics, as was I. I think that's why they invited me, and, and I wasn't Catholic at the time. I'd already gotten saved and given my heart to the Lord, but we're sitting around, and the guy comes up, and I said, I'll take a double cheeseburger, <laughs> and they both looked at me with devil eyes. And they said, you're eating a double cheeseburger? I said, man, they got the best ones here. I'm glad you guys said we should come to lunch here because this is great. And, and so it came. I started biting into it. They were eating their fish sandwich. And, and so I just kept eating. Now, I wasn't thinking about it. or I prob Truthfully, I probably wouldn't have done it had I been thinking about it. No, I, I probably would have had mercy on them. There was a time I would have done it out of spite, but, but I would have had mercy on them. But 
the, uh, finally one of them said, you do know it's Lent, don't you? And, and I had a mouthful of burger at the time, and I went, mm-hmm. <laughs> is it? <laughs> and they said, yeah, and you're eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> and I looked at him, I looked, and I said, you're eating fish. <laughs> and I smiled, and they said, well, we thought you were a Catholic. And I said, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, I, and I'm not bound by any of those rules anymore. And I said, you can do the same thing I did, and you won't have to eat fish on Friday. <laughs> it was a quiet rest of the lunch. We as believers, though, we, we go through our life, and we, we need to know how to live. Now, the Word tells us in Ephesians 4, 4 through 7, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as we are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, listen to this now, to each one of us, to each one of us, let me slow that down. To each one of us. Grace was given. To each one of us, grace was given. Grace was not given to the church, and then the church had to divide up grace in a million different pieces and pass it all out to everybody. To each one of us, grace was given. But it wasn't just grace given in in little drops. It was grace given, grace given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Think about that now. How big was Jesus' gift to your life? How big is it? Richard said not measurable. Anybody else has an adjective? You have an adjective that describes how big was the gift? Monumental. How big? I heard another voice back here. How big? Infinity. Infinity, right? To infinity and beyond. It was that big. So grace is poured out to us according to that measure. According to that measure. Not according to our measure. I'll give you a dirty little secret. It's not even according to the measure that you think of you. It's, it's not according to the measure you think of yourself even. It's according to the measure. Get this. According to the God gives to you. You. Right where you sit. Just like you are today. God gives to you a measure of his grace According to how he thinks of Christ. Oh. Whoa. That, yes, Sandy says swimming. Yeah, you're in it. Now, you saw baptism, right? Baptism, it says there's one baptism. You don't have to be baptized for a whole bunch of things. Like, you know, you sinned this week, you joined this church, you joined that church you got to be baptized again because you got to be baptized. No, no. Listen, we're all baptized in the one body, one Lord, one Savior, one faith. The word baptismo means to be totally surrounded by. It is the picture of dropping a pebble into the ocean. It has water all around it. Only for the believer, the water's not just all around it, around us. The water is also inside of us. So when we are baptized into His grace, His grace is on the inside of us. His grace is also surrounding us. 
let's not use the word grace because you might get confused about that and think it's something, you know, uh, that you can't even fathom its meaning. Let's use the word favor. In the Greek, it's uh, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis. Charis means to have a full implementation of favor. In other words, you have somebody's favor. It is, it's not just that you have their favor. It's fully in, implemented into your life. So if Paula here has the Lord's favor, he had, the Lord isn't sitting over there saying, well, yeah, I like her. I favor her. I like her, her, her wavy black hair. You know, I like that she's married to Rick. I'm not sure how I feel about him, but I, I do like her. No, he loves Rick. <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't just favor Paula from over there. He fully implements the favor into her life. So it's, the favor is not over there to, at her. The favor is on her, inside of her. It's around her. God favors you even when you don't feel like you are favorable. God still favors you. And he still favors you with the same measure of favorability. Yeah, but you can say that because you're a pastor and you're holier than everybody else. Shot full of holes maybe more than everybody else. But I'm not just saying it because I'm a pastor and this happens to be the position that I hold within the body of Christ. I'm saying it because I've realized that as a believer, God's favor surrounds me as one who is face planted a few times in my life and been the righteous man that falls seven times or eight or nine or ten or twenty. And yet rises again, God's favorability on me is still there regardless of where I've been. And it's still in the same exact measure of what he gives out, not what I can entrust or hold in my own being. God favors me. And he favors you. And he favors you. Well, how, how big is that grace? How big can that grace possibly be well there's a few people in the scriptures because we you know sometimes we we say well yeah but you know how big is that really well when the whole earth the whole earth was wicked and evil i'm not talking about there was a couple bad apples i'm talking about the whole earth in fact in genesis 6 it says that every man's thoughts and intents of their heart Every man, every man, thoughts and intents of their heart. Man, that's bad. That's worse than the south side of Chicago. It's worse than Harlem. Yeah, East St. Louis. Pick the worst city. Bangladesh, bad. Bad news downtown Bangladesh. Worse than all of that. Find the most evil drug cartel you can think of. Worse. Most evil terrorist you can think of. Worse. The thoughts and the intents of every man's hearts were evil. Always continually. Continually evil. And yet the word says this. So the Lord said, I'm going to destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I'm sorry that I've ever made them. I don't even like that I made them. They become that evil. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How amongst all the millions of people that were on the earth at the time, how does one guy find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Then we jump over a few chapters. We find this guy named Abram. Abraham, the idol worshiper. Idol maker. His family made idols. That was, the, their, that was their living. Create an idol for somebody else to worship that wasn't God. He didn't know who God was, but he knew he wanted a baby. So he goes outside. He looks up at the stars of heaven. And he says, who are you? Where are you? There's got to be somebody that can do this for me. God responds back. says, Abraham or Abram, Abram. Yeah, yeah, who are you? I'm the Lord God, and I've heard you. I'll take care of that baby thing. Just believe me and walk with me. He found favor. We go over a little bit further. We find this guy named Moses. Moses gets abandoned by his brothers. He's kind of a, kind of a cocky little kid. Gets dreams and visions and then tells his brothers. And it just so happens the dreams and visions say his brothers are going to serve him. They don't like it too much. Joseph, I'm sorry. Joseph. So Joseph goes... And he, um, he ends up in a bad situation, ends up in the house of Pharaoh, be- becomes the head because God favors him. Here's this kid who's just, man, he, he's off the hook. He's got the favor of his father, and he's got the favor of the Lord on his life, and it never leaves no matter where he's at. Then we come to one of his down-the-line ancestors, a guy by the name of Moses. Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house. He grows up as an Egyptian. Not as, not as a Jew, although he knows he's a Jew. But he doesn't grow up as a Jew. He grows up in Pharaoh's house. They worship Ra, the sun god. If the sun's out, God must be out. They worship pagan images. All kinds of goofy rituals that they do in their life. He grows up in that But he finds favor with the Lord. So much so that God meets him out in the middle of the desert after he's murdered a man. Meets him out in the middle of the desert. Hey, Moses. Only speaking from a burning bush. Moses takes over and becomes the deliverer of Israel. We find Moses talking to God in Exodus 33. Moses says to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. You found favor in my sight. Now therefore I pray. Moses talking. If I found grace in your sight. Show me now your way. That I might know you. And that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And, he's, and God responds back. Because what's Moses asking for? Grace. Favor. I can't ask God for that. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I think, what I do. You can't be worse than the people in Noah's time. You can't be worse than anybody else that's ever lived. Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. So if you're worse than anybody else, you're a brand new thing. I love when people say on TV... This is unprecedented. Everything today is unprecedented. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything that has already uh, been, or that is, has already been. It's already happened. Everything. What we got to learn how to do, find grace. And understand we're baptized into grace. Surrounded with his favor. Moses, I love the way he approaches God. You know why? Because there's all kinds of things going on around him that are not favorable. It's not working out. He goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, yeah, okay, I'll let your people go after the first plague. I'll let your people go. Then the next plague, okay, I'll let your people go. And then every day, the next day, he changes his mind. Puts... Harder and harder burdens on the people. So much so that the people that Moses is trying to free are going back to to Moses. And they're saying, we think you are an imposter. 
We don't, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't heard from God. We're following you. And look, now he's making it harder on us. Moses, just wait. Frogs are coming. And just wait. Blood's coming. Just wait. Wait this way. Take a lamb. Take it into your house. Let me tell you what you have to do. You're going to sacrifice that lamb on this night. You're going to take its blood. You're going to put it over your doorpost because there's an angel coming, a death angel, and it's going to kill the firstborn of every household of the Jews and the Egyptians. It's going to kill the firstborn of every household who doesn't have blood on the doorpost. Put the blood on the doorpost. If you have the blood on the doorpost, you are going to have favor with God. God's grace is going to be on you, and the, the death angel is going to pass by your place. If you just put the blood on the doorpost. Jesus says, I'm the door. I am the door. We put the blood on the doorpost, we have the favor of the Lord. How do, we, how do you do that, Pastor? We don't do that kind of stuff anymore. I don't even have any sheep at my house. You don't, that's the great part. You don't have to do it anymore. God put the favor so much on those who believe that it's already done for us. The blood is already on the doorpost. The favor of the Lord has already been given. The lamb has already been slain. Then God tells Moses, he says, listen, I will favor you. In fact... I'm going to go with you. Because one of the, Moses' complaints to the Lord, he says, listen, you know, we're out here in this desert. You, yeah, you plagued them and all that. You killed the Egyptians in the water. But now look, we're out here. The people are complaining because they don't have water. Then you give us water. Okay, but we got to drink water out of a rock. Oh, right, Lord, listen, I know it's great that we're out here and everything, but we got this stuff called manna. We're eating it every day. Yeah, every, nobody's sick. Our clothes aren't wearing out. It seems like we have your favor, but these people are going to string me up because they're tired of eating this bread stuff. They want a carb-only diet. So they're eating manna every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. God says, what do they want? They just want a few quail. God says, okay. I'm going to give you quail, but you got to eat all the quail. What I send you, you got to eat. You're going to have favor with the quail. They got up the next morning. There were quail, so many quail. All, they covered the ground. It said that they ate quail in so much abundance that it was coming out of their noses. They had eaten so much quail. The people were sick and they were like, give us some manna. So God is listening to Moses' complaint. And Moses at one point in time in, in Exodus 34 says, listen, God, I know we're stiff-necked people. I know you're stiff-necked people. We, 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 we are stiff-necked. We, we are hard-headed, he was telling God. God, we're hard-headed. Anybody here been hard-headed? You dig your heels in? I think everybody has. Betty says to me all the time, you just want your way. I say, yeah, in 43 marriage, I never have. Gotten it, that is. <laughs> We can be hard-headed, and that's exactly what he's telling God. Listen, I know we're stiff-necked people, but if you don't go with us, we're not going. If you don't go with us, God, we're not going. Have I found favor or not? God says, listen, you found favor. I'll go with you. You know what Jesus told us when he departed from the earth? You found my favor. Not only did Jesus say, you found my favor and I'll go with you. He said, you found my favor, I will go with you, even to the ends of the earth. 
I never, never, ever, never, ever. In fact, the term, when Jesus says, I will never leave you, the term in Hebrew, the verb tense that's there, means never, ever, without any possibility. Never, ever. There is no possibility why I leave you or forsake you. I will go with you, but it cannot be reversed. If I'm going with you, you can't reverse me going with you. It is, it is a thing that I'm doing. It can never, ever stop. Well, wait a minute. What if I decide not to go with the Lord? Okay. Because as you're walking, you know, he said turn right, you turn left. God goes, whoops, we're taking a turn. And he's right behind you. You ever get yep, this word, backslidden? I, I, lo I love, I, I can say this because I used to do this, okay, as, as a pastor. We have a special invitation right now for the backslider. If you're backslidden in the church and you're away from God, your life is trashed. You feel like a dirt ball. Don't be embarrassed right now, but stand up and come forward. It's not a real, that invitation doesn't get a lot of response. They do slide out the back door. But God says, and people say this like this. Well, yeah, but you know, I'm backsliding. God don't want me. This, the scripture says God is always married to the backslider. He's always married to the backslider. Tell me how you get away from a guy who's going to marry you even when you divorce him. <laughs> Think about that. Get that down in your head. You're trying to get rid of him. And he won't leave you. You say, well, I'll get a protective order. <laughs> Where are you going for that? To hell? They ain't going to give you one either down there. Because God is always married to the backslider. God is going to be with you always continually, 100%. He cannot, because of his own promise, he cannot leave you or forsake you. He cannot. Well, what if he wants to? It doesn't make any difference what God wants. He says, I will always do my word. I cannot not do my word. book of Hebrews implies for us that if God ever once lies, ever once lies, if God ever once lies, he would cease to be God because God cannot lie. So if God could lie, then God can't be God if he could lie. Wow. So if he can't lie, in his word, if he cannot lie without taking himself out of the position of being God. And if all the world is held together by him, all the universe, it says that every single part of the universe is held together by the person of Jesus Christ. What happens if God quits being God? Everything, your life, my life, this earth ceases to even exist. That's how strong the promise of God is to his word. Psalm 5, verses 11 and 12. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. Now listen to this line. Because this is what I want you to understand about what God does for us. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. With favor. You will surround him. Who? The righteous. 
who is the righteous? If you've been here, you know it's us. It's us. Because the word says that we, we believers, are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus this morning, you are the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. You are the right standing of God. When God says, give me an example of right standing, he points. Yeah, he points to Charles. Richard said, bypass me, I'm not. No. <laughs> he points to Charles, and he goes, righteous. That's a great example of righteousness. Then he looks at Don, the righteousness. Yeah, and Richard's going over there. Yeah, I knew he was going to skip me. No, righteous. Righteous. God looks, if you looked in God's dictionary, any single one of you, if you looked in God's dictionary, you look up the word righteous, you're going down, and get to righteous, righteous. You go over to where the dictionary is, and there's a picture of you there. And you look, and you go, that can't be me. And, and then, you, then you start reading it. K breaks, most righteous, child of the most high God, gave her life to Christ, and got a date in there. And she followed the Lord. And she, she sought in her heart to seek his word. She discovered new things. And it, it starts listing the whole list. Oh, Pastor, you don't mean that. You, you, God doesn't do that. Book of Malachi. Book of Malachi, chapter 3. After all the stuff about tithing and all that kind of stuff, it says, then those... Then those who believed the Lord cried out to him, talked to him. And it says that God caused a book of remembrance to be written about what they were saying to each other about God. Yeah, it says it, doesn't it? The word says that he has your name engraved on the palm of his hand. How often do you look at your palm? Not very often. What, what if the name of your kids was on the palm of your hand? Sandy says, sometimes you get their imprint on the palm of your hand. <laughs> what, what, what if your kids' names were on the palm of your hand? You'd look at it. I see people with tattoos of their kids and that on their arms and stuff. That's probably a better place than on your back because you can't ever see them back there. But get, you know, what if they were on your palm of your hand? You'd, you'd look at them. God has every single one of his children written on the palm of his hand. He knows the palm of your hand is right there in front of you. You can look at it anytime. God has caused the angels to write a book about what you say about him. And when you talk to other people about him. The book is written. When you go to your name in the book. When you're running down your name in God's book. And you find righteous there. And you go over and you find your picture. It's not just your picture. It is everything that you have spoken about God. As you've spoken about it. it well I've said some horrible things about God. I just oh. What if he's written them down. Yeah, except God doesn't record those things. It says the implication from Malachi is he only records the things that you say about him that are favorable to him, and he responds back by returning favor to you. So everything that God does for you, God does to bring favor into your life. When this says that you are surrounded... With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. When you see a shield in a movie, did you ever watch any old movies? Roman movies and stuff like that where they're fighting and they got shields and swords. Where's the shield at? Right here, right? In front. What's it do? Protects you, 
from swords, arrows, knives, whatever else is being thrown out there on the battlefield, right? It can also be used as a weapon. Push your enemy back, right? So you can strike him. What happens when the shield surrounds you? You can't get to you. You're invincible. The darts of the enemy cannot get to you when you are surrounded by the favor of the Lord. Your life, your life becomes a life that is impervious to evil. Well, yeah, but pastor, I know a lot of good people. They, they've had evil things happen to them. Your life is surrounded with a shield. When you have the favor of the Lord, there are things in our life we will never understand. But I can promise you that every believer surrounded with the favor of the Lord, their life is protected. Their life is protected. Now, I don't know what goes on in some people's lives. Neither do you. We couldn't even judge. What I do know, the Word says... It's appointed on the men but once to die. After that, the judgment. It's going to happen to everybody. Bad things are going to happen to good people. Well, Pastor, I thought when I got saved, bad things are going to quit happening. Life is interesting in this. God puts us on the earth. He tells us what his word is. He tells us all the good. He Tells us how things will work in every direction. Tells us he protects us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Tells us we're going to heaven. Promises us we're going to heaven. We, we have all kinds of teachings about the ultimate place we want to be is heaven. All that. And then as soon as somebody goes to heaven, we try and figure out why they went. We want to know what they did wrong that they went to heaven. Regardless of the age or the time or what their life was like. Listen, when we're born again, bought by the blood of Jesus, our days may be numbered. According to everything we know, there's a time coming for us. That time, between now and that time, who cares? Because the only thing that is important to God is what do you do between now and then? While you're in that space of time, you are surrounded with the Lord's favor. You are surrounded with His love. You are surrounded with His grace. You are surrounded with everything that the Lord can give you. You are surrounded. And so, most of us live life this way. We live it for what happened today, and we look back at yesterday. And then we look way off in the future, what happens when I go? What the Lord's telling us, by telling us he surrounded us completely with his favor. You got to live life today, for today. For what's happening today. You can't look back at yesterday. Because it doesn't make any difference. You can't change it. You can't look forward. Way into the future and say. Well I'm hoping for this time. Because it could be tomorrow. It could be in the next 30 seconds. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 20. And it doesn't make any difference when that time is because the the favor of the Lord is a now time. It's today. It's today. Where am I at today? When when am I going to get to heaven? When you go. (laughs) That's right. Take no thought for tomorrow. Take thought for today. 
If you have the favor of the Lord, it's today. It's today. We've, in recent weeks, lost to the earth some really good men. Brother Jim Lothian, Brother Jim Baldwin, and, and Otto Allmendinger. They all went to heaven. They all went to heaven in their 80s. They all lived great lives. They all were blessed beyond imagination. I had somebody ask me, they said, when are all the bad, times gonna, when are all the bad things going to stop? And I said, well, what bad things? Well, you know, those... Those guys going to heaven. I said, what was bad about it? There wasn't anything bad about it. It was good. Because it's a reminder that the promises of God are 100% in play. We are surrounded by his favor. That's why we had those guys. We are surrounded by his favor. And they were surrounded by his favor. That's why. Because they were baptized in the Lord's favor. That's the reason why we could have the services that we had to commend them home. Nancy lost her mom. When, when was that? July, yeah. She had a great, uh, I mean a really great service for her mom's home going. Her mom was 100 years old. Minister's wife. Man, you know she had favor. The whole service was about how wonderful it was to have her. And now she's in the heavens. You see, we practice this here because we want people to know we're already dead. We're already dead to this world. But we are alive to Christ. We're, we're, we're already dead to the world. Let me ask you a question. If there's a, if we had a, a casket here right now and we had a dead person in it. And you walked up and you cussed at the dead person. Do they care? Can you offend them in some way? If you mooned them right there, would, would they be upset? Would they cry and scream? Why do we get so upset by the world and all that's around us? We are baptized with his favor, surrounded on all sides with his favor. We got life to live right now, and it's going to take us to there. And when we get there, all the promises of God, everything we ever dreamed about, will be true and we'll be it'll be in full display amen amen stand to your feet would you like to have chili we've got a bunch of food over there in the gymnasium we're going to eat and we're going to celebrate these folks who got baptized, fully identified with Christ. Fully identified with Christ. I say fully identified with Christ. Dead to the world, alive to Him. New in every part of our being, new. That's awesome. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to. You need to. You need to discover who He is. You can come on up right now and we'll pray. We'll pray. And the Lord will bring down His favor into your life. He'll, he will change your life. If you don't know who Jesus is, give your heart to Him right now. Anybody here and you've been struggling with that relationship? And you say, listen, Pastor, I just need, I just need prayer. I just need prayer because I, I, I want to come, 
I want to get back fully. I want to get back fully. I want to turn around and realize Jesus is following me. I want to turn my life around fully and say, I know Jesus is following me. He's with me. Come on up and let's pray. Come on up and let's pray. Amen. Anybody else? You want to, you want to pray? You just want to pray and say, I, I, want to, I want to get back all the way. I want to know that Jesus is there with me. I want to know it. Everybody else okay? All right. We want to pray. We want to pray. What's your name again? Jaina? Jada. It's Jada. Amen. Corey? Jennifer. Jada, Corey, and Jennifer. Man, uh, you guys are all related. Niece? All right. Beyonce? Yeah, this is Miss Pickett's son. Let's pray. You guys ready? Give me your hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Jada and Jennifer and Corey, Father, they all come. They all come to you right now, Father God, not realizing you've been following them closely. You are right behind them. Father, you've always been right on top of them, Lord God. They just never stop long enough to turn around and find out you were there. Father, right now, they realize your presence is with them. They realize, Lord God, that you are surrounding them with your favor. That you are embracing them, loving them, forgiving them, holding them. Father, that you are building them up. Father, for they are wonderful, magnificent images of Christ. Father, I pray, Father God, that you would just bless their hearts. Bless their minds, Lord God. Bless their minds with, with clean and gentle, contrite spirit. Father, let it be inside of them. Let them have hope, Lord God, beyond hope. Let them have a new vision, Lord God, a realization of your grace and your mercy. Father, and how big that is in their life. Father, you love them. You bless them. We bless them now as a church family, Lord God. Welcome them back into the fellowship of the believers. Father, they're blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for it, Father. We bless them right now in Jesus' name. Blessing. Blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Welcome home. Welcome home. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Hey, Ed, can you make sure that they get cards that we, we have their information? Amen. Well, let's pray. Bless the food. Bless the offering. Bless our bellies. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, the food today is blessed. It is nourishing to our bodies. Father, there is nothing in it that is harmful for any of us, Lord God. Father, we just speak over it, Lord God, that it will be totally healthy for our entire being. And we thank you for the hands that prepared it. Bless them as well. Father, bless the offering today, Lord God, and all the, those that give. Father, bless them abundantly above all that they're able to ask or to think. Father, bless them to receive it because you pour it in, Lord God, bread upon the water in waves of blessing. Father, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. Thank you for the people today, Lord God, who've come to watch, come to be baptized, come, Lord God, to give their hearts back to you and, and to embrace your, your, your abundant life around them. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 
Amen. Join us in the gymnasium for some good grub. And jump online on Wednesday night. Man, we have got a great class going.